I appreciate your zeal in singing this morning and the sweet prayers that have been offered. I do desire a continued interest in your prayers as we look to the Word of God, that we might find those things that would glorify His name and would be a great comfort to us. We just sing we can go with the song for the soul you never die. The word soul refers to the very essence of our life. It often refers to the body that's alive with the spirit in it. But it actually goes beyond even that. The word soul depicts depicts the very essence of life. The soul is the person. It could be said that that the soul is the God-given spirit that's alive. It's the soul that is the person that has intelligence, that has judgment, that has emotions, desires, and an identity. I struggled over the years to, to grasp the relationship between the spirit and the soul. The best I could come up with for my own understanding is the spirit is equitable to the electric energy that's in a power circuit. The spirit is there, but the light is that soul. Because the light is how you know that energy is there. We know that we have a spirit because there's light. There's desires, there's love, there's hurt, there's joy, there's shame, there's an uplifted spirit. All of that because we have a soul. The soul has three basic states to it. There's the soul that's in the body when the body's alive. That's one. And the next stage is when the body is dead. And the soul is with the Lord. The place where the soul never dies. Then the third state is that state when the soul of the spirit will be with the body again on the day of the resurrection of the dead. The soul. If you will turn back with me to Genesis chapter 2, in Genesis chapter 2, I'd like to begin to examine the first state. And I do desire an interest in your prayers as I have studied this subject. It has become larger and larger the more that I study. When God had created everything that he is, God is the creator, then God formed man. Verse number 7, this is Genesis 2 and 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. And listen to this. And he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Now that word breath comes from the same word that we get spirit and ghost. The Holy Spirit and the Holy Ghost. So God breathed into that body that he had just formed his spirit. And then he says, and man became a living soul. Adam was alive, having emotions, having personality, having character, having love, having hurt, all those things that made him alive was the soul. And God gave it to him. He breathed into his nostrils and he began, he became a living soul. Now, to emphasize yet again the the state of the soul, the states of the soul, turn with me to Genesis chapter 35, 
Genesis chapter 35, verse number 16. In this day, being Israel or Jacob, this day and his family, and they journeyed from Bethel, and there was but a little way to come to Ephrath, and Rachel prevailed. She had hard labor. And it came to pass when she was in hard labor that the midwife said unto her, Fear not, thou shalt have this son also. And it came to pass as her soul was doing what? As her soul was departing, for she died, that she called his name, his son, Benoi, but his father called him Benjamin. Rachel's soul was departing. Now, if, as we understand, the word soul is the essence of life, <coughs> then her life departed. Her life didn't cease. It departed. Her life didn't terminate. It departed. Her life didn't go to sleep. It departed. Now keep that in mind. Now I want you to turn with me concerning our soul in this stage. In life. Turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 1. King David was an old man. King David was near his death. And when it, when it appeared that others were going to take the throne away from him, David called Bathsheba and told her that Solomon, her son, would reign in his stead. Beginning in 1 Kings chapter 1, verse number 28. Then King David answered and said, Call me Bathsheba. And she came into the king's presence and stood before the king. And the king swear and said, As the Lord liveth, which hath redeemed my what? Soul out of distress. And he goes on to verse number 30 to tell her that Solomon's going to reign after him. He redeemed his soul out of distress. Now think for a moment what distress is. Distress is a state when we're down, we're discouraged, uh, we're, we, we're on the uh, a verge of losing hope. We think that maybe all is lost. David says, in the name of the one who has redeemed, that means he has gone and taken my soul out of distress. That's the God that we have. The you, God reaches and takes out of distress, redeems us from distress, takes us from gross sadness, and fills us with extraordinary happiness and joy in his presence. Now, the 23rd Psalm, if you would turn there with me, the 23rd Psalm, um, probably uh, the second most famous passage of Scripture in all of the Bible. David begins this in adoration of his God, worshiping God. He says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He does what? Restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He restoreth my soul. Now that tells me that if the Lord restores, if our shepherd restores our souls, that means our soul, that David's soul was in a state of despair. He'd lost hope, he'd lost joy, and lost peace. David would have even asked him, where are you, Lord? I'm out here in the wilderness, Lord. Uh, David, in Psalm 51, instead of God, uh, petitioned the Lord to re, uh, restore to me the joy of thy salvation. There are times when we can lose that joy, lose that peace in life because of the distresses of life. But David says, Lord, you're my shepherd, you're my keeper, you're my leader. A shepherd is a protector, a shepherd is a physician, a shepherd is a, uh, is a nutritionist, a shepherd is a leader. A shepherd cares for his sheep. Jesus Christ said in John chapter 10, 
I am the good what? Shepherd. He says, I know my sheep and am known of mine. Meaning, not to know, that's just being he's cognizant of them. To know, using that word, means to, I am aware of them in a loving way. I love them. I know my sheep and am known of mine. That means my sheep love me. In common everyday language, Jesus said, I love my sheep and my sheep love me. I love them so much that I give my life for my sheep. I lay down my life for the sheep. And a good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. And so David says, he restored my soul. And there's a lot of things uh, that can uh, uh, press us down into distress, in troubles, in trials of this life, so that our soul needs to be restored. That doesn't mean that doesn't mean he makes it over, or he takes a dead soul and makes it alive. That means he brings it back to joy when there is no joy. Now turn with me to Psalm number fifty-one, forty. Uh, pardon me, Psalm number forty-two. Uh, Psalm number forty-two. <clears throat> This is David depicting himself in a state of constant sorrow. It is only hope in a state of constant sorrow is his hope. Now listen to these words. As the heart or the deer, as the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my what? Soul after thee, O God. My, can you see a deer running through the woods, maybe ahead of a pack of dogs, and, and, he's, and he's hot, and he's lathered, and, and he's uh, anxious, and he's looking for a way of escape, and it's hot, and it's dry up there, and you could just see that deer, oh, if I could just stop long enough to get a cool drink from this little creek. David says, I'm like that heart, or like that deer. I'm running ahead of my troubles, my troubles are pursuing hot after me. He says, as the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee. That means I'm breathing hard. I, 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 I long for, I so desire uh, to, to drink of thee, O Lord. I'm panting in my very soul for you. Your life that's panting after God. So panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God. So we have a panting soul, and now we have a thirsty soul. It's like, it's like you're outside working on a very hot and a dry day. The heat is, we've had so many days, it's up near 100 here this year, and you're outside working and you're hot, and, and you think about that cool drink of water. I remember as a child, we'd be out working in the, in the garden or in the field, and and I don't want to stop and take a drink. I could just, I could just picture that jug uh, with that cool water in it and the frost running on the side of it. I said, Dad, can we stop and get a, a drink of water? Dad said, Nope, not yet. We've got to work on the fire. And by the time we got to, to where we could get a cool drink of water, it was so refreshing to, uh, to have that cool, refreshing drink of water. I did just revive us. David says, My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? David says, you're the most important thing. Is everything else around me is failing in my view. And so I'm thirsting for you. My soul is, is longing for you, Lord. My tears have been my meat day and night. While they continuously say, where is thy God? Uh, sometimes we can fall into such a state and they will want to say, has God forgotten this person? Uh, is their trouble so great that God just don't care anymore? God just don't leave them in their despair? And the others say, where is thy God? Notice what he says. When I remember these things, I pour out my what? So I pour out my soul in me. Now, so if he's pouring out his soul, what is he doing? He's praying to his God. He's coming before that great throne and pouring himself out before God. That's what we ought to find ourselves often. We ought to put ourselves in our position to pour out our soul unto our God, to cry unto Him. He says, For I have gone with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God with the voice of joy and praise, and with the multitude that kept holy day. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? The soul that is cast down. They used to talk about the soul that panted, the soul that thirsts after God. Now he says, He refers to the soul that is cast down. That's an old shepherd's term. When one of their little lambs 
was either sick or injured or stuck in the in the muddy place and could not get up. I mean, they were down and could not get up. The shepherd would reach down with that hook on the end of the staff and retrieve that little lamb that was down and could not get up. Uh, so when he says, as his wife, I cast out, he's talking about a, a little lamb that's looking up uh, to his shepherd. The shepherd's coming, walking across the pasture. And then the, the lamb is looking at the shepherd and saying, I'm down and I cannot get up. I'm in a miserable state and I can't melt my hands up. He says, um, why art thou cast down? Then he turns to himself and says, why are you in this state? Why art thou cast down, O oh, my soul? Why art thou out, uh, disquieted in me? That's my soul. Why is my soul? My soul? Soul. Why are you disquieted in me? You know what it means to be quiet? It means to be peaceful. A disquieted soul is a soul that's not quiet or at peace anymore. A, 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 a disquieted soul is a soul that's disturbed, that's anxious, that's afraid, that's upset, that's hurt, that's lonely, that's facing great trials. My soul is disquieted within me, he's saying. Why are thou disquieted in me? Then he gives the answer when our soul is disquieted in us. He gives the answer, hope. Thou in God. That hope is not maybe. You hear me? That hope is not maybe. That hope is put your trust in God because you trust in a God that cannot what? Lie. That's a God, he says, coming to me all you that labor in the heaven laden, and I will give you what? Rest. He meant exactly what he said, and you can count upon that. Then he goes on and says, Why art thou cast down, O my soul, and why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. That means he smiles upon me with his help. He brings his help. He says, I'm going to praise him. That is with joy. My soul is cast down. My soul is disquieted. My soul is panting. My soul is thirsty for God. But there's coming a day that I'm going to praise him because my God has promised that he will never forsake me, that he'll never leave me alone. Oh, my God, my soul is cast down within me. That's coming before God and saying to God, I'm in a miserable state. You know, if you've ever been in such a miserable state where hope flees from you, the the prospect of a better day is no longer there. There's nothing but sadness. There's nothing but fear. Nothing but anxiety. Nothing but loneliness or hurt deep down in your soul. Sometimes it even feels like your body is in pain because your soul is so cast down. Verse number six, he says, Oh my God, my soul is cast down within me. And so when you're in that state, where do you go? To the same place that David did. David took it to the Lord. He says, my God, my soul is cast down within me. He's speaking to the one that can fix the problem. He's, fix, he's speaking to the one that can fix you. Did you know that your God has promised you in my language when you bring it to him, he is going to either fix the problem or he's going to fix you. One or the other. He's going to, he's the fixer. The permanent fixer. The real fixer. When you bring a trouble to him, he's either going to fix the trouble or he's going to fix you where you can stand it. Now, it goes on. My, oh my God, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore will I remember thee. He says, when I'm in that state, I'm going to remember thee, Lord. Now, when you remember the Lord, you know, Satan doesn't want you to do that. Satan will tell you, God is forsaken. you. Where is your God? Did he go off and leave you? Uh, God's got the about you. This problem is too big for him. God don't care anything about you anymore. He's going to throw you away. Satan will tell you all of this. Did you know that? Or maybe you've messed up. If we mess up, uh, Satan will say, you've messed up too bad this time. God has thrown you away. Satan will tell you that. The problems are too great. The burden is too great. Uh, and God's got other things to deal with. And he's not going to fool with you. Satan will tell you that. He'll convince you of that. But David says, my, Oh my God, my soul is cast down and within me. Therefore will I remember thee. And what do you remember about God? You remember God in the beginning. Who? In the beginning, God. God spoke the entire universe. 
in the bed. When you remember, if you think about the God that you're on your knees praying to, spoke the entire universe into being. When you remember him, you remember him uh, as the God who formed the first man from the dust of the earth and breathed into his nostrils and became a what? A living soul. You remember him. Not only that, when you remember God, you remember him in his sovereignty. You remember him as the God who before the foundation of the world made choice of a great multitude of people. He sent his son to die for those that he chose because Every man is in a state of sin in nature, right? For we have all sin that comes short of the glory of God. So it took the saving grace of the Son of God, the unspotted Lamb of God, to save us from our what? Sins. And that he's done because Jesus Christ said it to When you remember your God, you remember your God, your Savior, your Master, your Lord, hanging on Golgotha's cross, he said to God the Father, it is finished. That means I have saved everyone that you've given me from their sins. And one sweet day, they're going to be with me in paradise. Oh, speaking of that, the thief found out that day. That day, he was taken to where the soul never dies. Verse number seven. He says, deep calleth unto deep at the noise of the water spouts. Just troubles everywhere. You know, a water spout is like a little tornado in the water. Little tornadoes that were just troubles just eating at us and frightening us from every direction. The waves and thy billows are gone over me. If the waves have gone over, over you, what's the next thing that you expect to happen? You're going to drown. I'm overwhelmed. It's all done now. So we might as well just give up. The waves have gone over me. I'm overwhelmed, I'm distressed, I'm thirsty, my heart is broken, I'm afraid. Verse number 8, he begins, yep, the waters have gone over me, but verse number 8 says, yep, the Lord will command his what? Loving kindness. The commander. Do you know God is the commander? Jesus is referred to in Isaiah as the commander. And he commands, and it what? Stands fast. What he commands, it happens. He commanded the Red Sea, and the Red Sea parted. Amen? It didn't do that, did it? Also, he commanded, and it came back together on the entire Egyptian army. Again, uh, when they were in the wilderness, he commanded, and there was water that came from the rock. Again, he commanded, and the Jordan River opened up. He commanded, and the sun uh, held in its place. He commanded, and the sun went backward on the sundial. He commanded, and the dead rise. This is the Lord who has power over all things. When you're on your knees praying to this God, you remember that the God that you're praying to has power over all things. Yet the Lord will command his loving kindness. Now, let's break that down. It's one thing to love somebody, isn't it? To love. Love is that tender, sweet feeling that, that attracts you to someone. Kindness is what you do because you have that love for somebody. God chose to love you, and therefore he chose to be kind for you. So it's called, called loving kindness. When I am cast down, my loving, kind God comes on the scene and lifts me up. When I'm in distress, when I'm thirsty, when I'm lonely, when I'm hard, my heart is broken. When I'm afraid, when I've messed up and my sins are ever before me, when I'm in that state, I cry to my God and... In his loving kindness, he comes to me. That's what David is saying. By the way, David did sin. You know that? David did sin. He sinned awfully. Committed adultery. Committed uh, uh, murder. David did all of those things. Not only that, he disobeyed God. God told him, don't you, don't you count Israel. Don't you number them. You don't need to know how many is there. You just trust in me. But David was so exalted in himself that he figured, well, I need to know how many people I'm reigning over. And he counted them. And that day, trouble came over Israel. And he paid an awful price. That's, that is that is when David offered that sacrifice on um, on Ordan's threshing floor. And the, and the plague upon Israel stayed that day. David knew what it was like to mess up. And he knew what it was like to be blessed and to be filled with the grace of God in spite of the fact that he messed up. It's an amazing thing that God saves anybody. You know that? Take the Apostle Paul, for example. 
Would you have chosen a man like the Apostle Paul to be an apostle? He had been, in those days, in the earlier days of his life, he would have walked into our church, hauled us all down to prison, and, and convicted me and had me killed. That was the kind of, you know, I know that for a fact, because he was there uh, on the day that uh, Stephen was stoned to death, given his approval and his authority to stone Stephen. But yet God trailed, chose that man, called that man, and turned that man, and as soon as he received his sight, after God blinded him, he received his sight. Do you know what the next thing that, uh, uh, that, that Saul of Tarsus did in the city of Damascus? He started preaching Jesus Christ. As soon as God gave him his sight back, he began to preach Jesus Christ. That's the God that commands our love. Yet the Lord will command this loving kindness in the daytime and in the night. In the night. You know, if you're troubled, the worst time of your trouble is at night. I am. Uh, I never saw a great deal of combat. But where I was in Thailand, we were under constant threat of saboteurs coming on the installation. They did from time to time. I worked for a while on the night shift loading cameras on aircraft while they were flying missions over North Vietnam. And if you're going to get scared in a hostile environment at night is when it's going to happen. Every little sound Every little click will stop you and make you look for cover. It's a frightening environment. And they turn out all the lights. And the slightest little glimmer of light will make your heart stop. David said, Yet the Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime. And in the night, when troubles seem the greatest. You know, if you have trouble in your life, in your life, and you lay down at night, and sleep just real night. You're just thinking about all of those troubles, all of those trials, all those things that disturb you. You worry about everything. You try to go to sleep. Try to get your mind on sleep, but sleep won't come. David said, oh, sometimes, Lord, I'm like that. But he says, yet the Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime and in the night. When we're in that state, in the night, his song shall be with me and my prayer unto the Lord, uh, to the God of my life. David says, you know, when I get in that state, I just stop and start praying. You know that? It's amazing how that works. I've been awake at 2 o'clock, 2.30, 3 o'clock at night, worrying about some of you all and the issues and the sickness and the troubles that you all have just come on my mind and I can't go back to sleep. So you know what I do? I just start praying. I say, Lord, um, this person has got this trouble, this trial. Uh, there's the sickness in and their family's got problems. Lord, I need you to help them. Lord, please have mercy upon them. And I start talking to the Lord. And you know what? The next thing I know is daylight. God of loving kindness and mercy. When we bring our issues to Him and leave them there, that's what Peter was talking about in 1 Peter chapter 5. Casting all your care upon Him, for He careth for you. That means He is on scene taking care of you like the good shepherd doing things for you that you cannot do for yourself. Alright. Verse number 9, He says, I will say unto, my, unto God my rock. Now, when He says, I, I will say unto my God, he qualifies God, explains God as this rock. So why do you need a rock? David's like, I'm out in the middle of this water, and the water's overflowing me, and I'm about to wash away, but the Lord's given me a rock to put my arms around. I'm going to hold on to this rock, and so the waves will not take me away. The Lord is your rock. He's your stability. That means he's your stability, he's your strength, he's your comfort, he's your peace, when everything else around you is failing. I will say to my God, Unto God my rock. 
Why hast thou forgotten me? Now listen to this. You ever think that God has forgotten you? David did. He got to the point that he thought, well, maybe God just don't care anything about me anymore. Maybe he's just thrown me away. Why hast thou forgotten me? Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? All these troubles around me keep oppressing me, pushing me down and pushing me down. Lord, where are you, by the way? As with the sword in my bones, my enemies reproach me while they say daily unto me, Who is thy God? The point is that no matter how bad it got, David, Maintain his faith in his God. Even when others said, where's your God? If you're in this condition, where's your God? Surely God would not leave you in this condition. Then David concludes the psalm this way. Why are you cast down? Oh my soul, why, why are you cast down? Just why? You ever just thought, that, well, why do I feel so bad? Why, do, why am I so miserable? Why am I so discouraged? Why do I have any hope? Why art thou cast down, O oh, my soul? And why art thou disquieted within me? Here is the answer. Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him who is the help of my countenance and my God. David says, yet yeah, all these bad things happen to me. Distress has come, discouragement comes, I'm thirsty, I am, I, I am hurt, I am lonely, I, and others have thrown me away, but I'm going to keep my hope in God. Because my God, He's the help of my countenance. Countless means when you're in such a low state, you look pretty pitiful. You ever had somebody walk up to you and say, What's wrong with you? You look, you look bad. You're cast down. You, all, all you do is frown. Oh, what's wrong? David says, you know, the God of my loving kindness, he's going to come to me. He's going to help my counsel, not my countenance. He's going to make me look better. Now, if he makes you look better, he doesn't just go paint on a better look. You know what we do sometimes? You, you ever do that? You ever go to, you ever go to the mirror and get ready to go out? He said, well, I feel miserable. I just don't feel like going out. I don't feel like meeting people. I don't, I don't, I just, I, I just, I just want to crawl in the hole somebody, but I got to go. So I go in there and I make the best shoes that I could. I, 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 I related this to the funeral Friday. Um, Sister Mary, uh, just before she went to the, to the hospital from the nursing home, I walked in the room there and, uh, she said, you know, I still owe you a haircut. I thought to myself, do I look that bad? <laughs> I understand. Do I look so bad? She needs to help my parents some. I probably did. But sometimes we do. We look bad. We feel bad. And our bad feelings come out in our face. When David says, you know, when I am down and I feel so bad that others can see my misery in my face, he says, I'm going to hope in my God and he's going to be the health of my country. He's going to replace that despair, that anxiety, that sad face. He's going to replace it with a smile. All right. Now we're just going to be Psalm 63. Psalm 63. The scene changes slightly. Psalm 63. Here again in verse number 1, David says, Oh God. <laughs> you know what? <clears throat> this is an exclamation. Oh God. Thou heart, my God. My God. I trust in you. I worship you. I adore you. You're everything to me. O oh God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee, my flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land uh, where no water. He says, my, uh, you're my whole reason, God. You're my hope of my life. You're my joy when there is none. You're my peace when there is none. You're my happiness when there is none. First of all, why? He says, my soul shall be what? Satisfied. My very person is going to be satisfied as with Mara and fatness, that means the good things, and my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips. He says, I have been so down, Lord, but I brought it to you, Lord, and when I brought it to you, you satisfied me. You know what to be satisfied means? That means to be satisfied. <clears throat> I, I, I got a lesson in the word satisfaction many years ago. We, I was stressing that. On our base in Germany. We had a NATO commitment there, and so we had British forces and German forces and Italian folks and a few French and 
all the nationalities come in and uh, participate in our evaluation there. <clears throat> so we had the American evaluation and then the NATO evaluation, and they had two different outbreaks. And so all the NATO folks stepped through our, our outbreaking, and then they gave theirs. And so the American side had, and y'all help me, unsatisfactory, satisfactory, and, and excellent. Was that outstanding? Outstanding. That's what it was. And so this old British lieutenant colonel got up when it was his turn. He says, you Americans still haven't learned the English language, have you? But I mean, Jaws was just cranking out there because, you know, there's all of that that tension between the American forces and the British forces. And he says, you know what the word satisfied means? So what is better than being satisfied? What is better than satisfaction? It is, it can outstanding be better than satisfaction? Satisfaction means you've met the mark. Uh, satisfaction means it's just like it ought to be. It's just right. So if you've got a satisfaction, it means you're just right. I don't understand this outstanding stuff. And so, what David says, he says, my soul shall be satisfied. That means I've got everything that I need. What, if you're satisfied in the Lord, what else do you need? If you're satisfied in the Lord, what can be added to you? If you're satisfied, I have everything I need. In my, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That means I've, I'm satisfied in the Lord. It's good to think about the things that God satisfies us with. Isn't it? But that's another message uh, in itself. So my soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise thee uh, with joyful lips. He says, you've satisfied me so much, Lord. There are, there are, I'm adding to satisfaction again. And so if you're satisfied, you don't need to say so much, right? It means you're satisfied, you're satisfied, you have everything that's required and everything that's needed. So David says, I'm going to praise you. We come together this morning to praise God because he has satisfied us, hasn't he? He's filled us with the good things of his glory and his majesty. Now, Psalm number 66, start there with me briefly. Psalm number 66. Here David says, come in here, the verse number 16, Psalm 66 and 16, come in here, all ye that fear God. I will declare what he hath done for my soul. Has God done anything for your soul? One, he saved it. He shed his blood. If he hadn't done anything else, that's enough, isn't it? But does he satisfy you in your soul in this life? Does he lift you up when you're cast down? Does he nourish you when you're thirsty? Does your God do that? So, David says, I'm going to declare what he's done for my soul. If you have good things, who gets the credit for it? God does. You know, I often hear people speak of the word luck. My response usually is, you know, I don't really believe in luck. I believe in grace and divine providence. If it's good, God gets the credit for it. And if God gets the credit for it, we also tell who gets the credit for it. I thank God for his mercies. I thank God for his grace. I thank God for his help. I thank God for my peace and God for my joy. You know, have you ever just stopped and just tried to just run through a list of things to be thankful for? If you ever get down and really cast down and, and your pain within your soul, one of the things that helps is start thinking, you know, what good things do I have? How am I satisfied in this? What has God given me? I start sometimes. I was a little boy, raised a little boy, raised in a swamp. When I left Perry Park in 1969, I barely had a high school education. Didn't know nothing about nothing. That's what we're talking about. As a matter of fact, I barely even knew how to eat in a restaurant. I sit down in a nice restaurant and all these utensils around the plate. I had no idea. We were lucky 
money to have a fork. My heart played when I was a kid. And so there was a little fork over here and a big fork over here. There was a knife and a spoon here. And sometimes they even had a, a fork up at the top of the plate. I didn't know anything about anything. But God, in his abundant mercy, lifted me up and blessed me with abundance. He blessed me with peace and joy and to have things, things, physical things, and health. I was talking to Mr. Wilson Friday about how many people he's buried. Funerals I could have of people way younger than me. You ever think about that? How blessed we are. David says, God is so good to me. He's blessed my soul. I'm going to tell people how good God is to me and how he has blessed me. Now, Psalm 84. Psalm 84. Verse number one. This is about the church. He says, how amiable are thy tabernacles. How lovely are thy tabernacles. How beautiful. The tabernacle in the Old Testament was a type of the church in the New Testament. Is the church beautiful to you? I'm not talking about the church building. The church building ought to be well kept. Ought to look good too. But what is the church? It's you. You're the church. And I want to tell you something. To me, you're beautiful this morning. It don't have anything to do with your facial structure either. Don't have anything to do with when the last time was you had your hair done or how much makeup on. You're beautiful because your soul has been made lovely by God Almighty. So when you come together, it's a beautiful sight. Jesus Christ has chosen to describe you as his bride, his lovely bride. He loves you so much that he gave his very life for you. How, then he says, how amiable are thy tabernacles. That's plural, meaning the place is where the church meets. O Lord of hosts, my soul. Listen to this, my soul, my very being, my life, my soul longeth, yea, even fainted for the courts of the Lord. Go away from the church for a while. I had some experience with it. Be away from the church for a while. And I couldn't hardly wait. I was about two thirds of the way through. Through my tour in Germany. And I listened to what I could that I could enjoy. The tapes that were sent to me. One Sunday evening I was watching the Armed Forces Network News. There had been a, a mine cave in in West Virginia. And the news team was at an old Baptist church. They were standing at the door. Those precious souls were going into that into the Baptist church building. They began to sing amazing grace. I had such a hunger. I wanted to go home and walk into just such a place as this. Where I had real friends. Friends that would ever be with me. Friends that would embrace me. Friends that weren't ashamed to say, I love you. Friends that's ready to help me. Friends that love the same God that I love. I yearn for it. Where you know your friends. I visited. One time we were visiting in the towers there. And there was a lady told the sister that we were visiting. She said, who is those two men that keep coming in to see you? And the sister said, well, it's our pastor one of my deacons. This lady says, I go to church every Sunday and every Wednesday. And my pastor don't even know my name. Let me tell you something. We ought to know each other's names. 
We ought to call each other's names in prayer. When one is in need, we need to go see about that need. We need to use the telephone constructively to call and encourage and lift up and, and just to, just sometimes just call and say, Hi, I love you. I'm thinking about you. A church is a family. So he says, Oh, how amiable, how lovely are the tabernacles, O Lord of hosts. You know, do you look forward to walking into this building and just seeing people's faces? Sometimes I like to just stand over here and watch you all. When you greet one another, you embrace one another and tell each other of your love for each other and, and ask, how are you doing? I said, you know, sometimes you pass people in the elevator, in the, in the hallway and say, how are you doing? You know what I think? You don't know me and you don't even really care. You're just saying, there's just something to pass. But then to be among folks who care. They love you and they really want to know how you're doing. If you're feeling good, they want to know that so they can rejoice with you. If you're distressed, they want to know that so that they can encourage you. Oh, David says, oh, how amiable are thy tabernacles. Oh, Lord of hosts, my soul longeth, yea, even fainted for the courts of, of the Lord. My heart and my flesh crieth out uh, for the living God. He said, Lord, I want to be with you. I want to be with your people. Yea, the, uh, the sparrow hath found a house and has swallowed a nest for herself where she may lay her young, even uh, thy altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are they that dwell in thy house. They will be still praising thee, Selah. David says, this is a place for your family. Like the swallow that has her young, this is where our young ought to be. We ought to bring our young up in the house of God that they might experience this love. Why is love important? Because God said, with loving kindness, have I drawn thee. I need to say more about that, but we're about to run out of time. Would you go with me now to, <clears throat> to Psalm 103. Psalm 103. This is another area of scripture where we spend all day. Psalm 103. 103. Verse number 1. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. You know what the word bless means? Bless means to exalt with honor. Bless the soul. That means speak of God with honor. And that means to speak of Him with honor. It means to talk to each other about God with honor. You know, I, I do enjoy football. I like to do a little hunting. I like a little bit of this, a little bit. But you know, there's the greatest Joy I receive in my life is talking about the things of my Lord. How great things the Lord has done for me. Remember what the Lord told Legion? You know the man that he cast out all the devils? He says, go home to thy friends and tell them what? How great things the Lord hath done for thee and hath had compassion upon thee. Has God done great things for us? Amen. Has he had compassion upon us? Amen. So we have something to tell our friends, do we not? All right? Then he said, Blessed, bless the Lord, O my soul. That means pour it out. When you, when you bless the Lord with your soul, that means you pour it out. You tell it with energy. You say, Well, the Lord's been good to me. Yes. You know, we ought to speak of the Lord with excitement. Great is his name. Great is His glory. Great is His mercy. It's something to get excited about. My God loved me. And when I was dead in my sins, He gave His life for me. That's something to shout about, isn't it? Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. And all that is within me, bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. And forget not all His benefits. What benefits do we have? What benefits do we have? Frequently we talk about the physical benefits, all the comforts of life, the joys of life, the peace. You know, we haven't been attacked yet. Not yet. You may be coming, but not yet. All my life, never seen a major attack in my community, have you? You don't want to either. You don't want to see an enemy attacking you. Those of us in the military have seen that on scene and seen what happened. You do not want that here. 
And the only reason that it has not happened here, we have a good military. I thank God for our military. We have a good military. But I'm going to tell you something the Bible tells us over and over again. If God is not on scene, it don't make any difference how big the military is. You're under attack. We have been preserved and kept at peace by the grace and mercy of our sovereign God. That's a benefit. We can just go a long list of the physical benefits that I attribute to our God. But I'm going to tell you about another benefit. A benefit is somebody, something somebody gives you that you don't deserve, you haven't earned, you can't pay for. Alright? A benefit. It's a benefit that the Lord, our God, Sent his only begotten and beloved son in this world to pay my sin debt. That's a benefit. If there's no other benefits, that one is enough to shout about and rejoice in. Bless the Lord of my soul and forget all his benefits. Who forgiveth thine iniquities? Uh, um, who forgiveth all thine iniquities? Did you get that? Anybody in this room? Committed an iniquity. Do not, don't answer. I just want you to think the answer. Have you committed an iniquity this week? I have. Have you committed an iniquity? Not that you're proud of it, but is the fact that we are ashamed of our iniquities is a sign that we have a God-given soul. For who forgiveth all thy iniquities and healeth all thy diseases? Who does that? The God that we ought to bless and glorify. Who redeemeth thy life from destruction. Who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercy. Who satisfieth again thy mouth with good things. That means practical things. You have good things? I had a good thing for breakfast. Y'all have a good breakfast this morning? Well, if y'all miss it, if you didn't, there's still donuts out there. enough of that. Go to the first Peter chapter four. First Peter chapter four. We're not going to get to all the phases of this today. We we'll just take it as it comes. Go to the first Peter chapter four. Verse eight. Verse 17. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first began to, uh, at us, what shall the end um, be of them that obey not the gospel of God? But if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let them that suffer, according to the will of God, commit the keeping of of their souls in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. Now, let me just put this down just a little bit. Did you know that it is pleasing to God when trouble comes and you remain faithful to your God? You know, we talk about the sacrifices were done in the Old Testament. The animal sacrifices were but you know, we have the sacrifice of lips. When trouble comes, the distress comes, we're cast down, uh, we're discouraged, and we're thirsty, our soul is longing for the Lord. When we're in that state and we remain faithful to Him, that is pleasing to God. You want to please God? Jesus Christ tells us in John 14, 15, If you love me, do what? Keep my commandment. Now that's not qualified, if you feel like it. He didn't qualify that if you want to. He didn't qualify that if Green Bay's not playing at 12. He didn't qualify it with anything. He said, if you love me, you demonstrate. The, bit, the message is you demonstrate your love by keeping my commandments. So, he says, wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God Commit the keeping of their souls to him and well. He says, as we go about well doing, you say, my God is going to take care of my soul. 
He's going to sustain me. He's going to comfort me. He's going to lift me up. He's going to provide for me. He is either going to remove the trouble or he's going to make me able to bear it. That's your God. As a good, faithful creator. A faithful creator is one that created and he did not go off and leave his creation. There's a philosophy that says well, God did create things, everything, and then he just sort of left it to his own. He sort of set it on this course and set you on your course and it's up to you to get your way to heaven or to do this. He didn't do that. Our sovereign God is the creator and he's still in his throne and by divine providence he's moving and working in our lives so therefore he is worthy of our praise. Has he, has he fed your soul? If he's fed your soul, he's worthy of our praise.